So, over the past month, I have been leaking a litany of information about AMD's upcoming Zen 5 products. And there really does need to be an S at the end of that word. Products. As there are a lot of Zen 5 family products coming in the next year. It's not just one or two. But don't worry. I have simultaneously been accumulating information on Intel's 14th gen and 15th gen products in parallel. And frankly, I've already been dropping hints that, well, I think 2024 is going to be a rough year competitively for Intel still. I do think that AMD may be underestimating how good some of Intel's upcoming products will be. And, well, the reason I prioritized Zen 5 leaks before Intel leaks is because uh, Strix Halo really excites me more than most products have in a while. And there were a lot of bad Zen 5 leaks, so I thought those should get priority over Intel. But I haven't been ignoring Intel. And in fact, one slide I got from an AMD contact that depicts projected performance between upcoming APUs is something that I've specifically said already in multiple pieces of content does not line up with what I've seen of Meteor Lake from my Intel contacts. And in fact, I now want to put this quote on screen. Meteor Lake is supposedly so good with its integrated graphics that many OEMs, I am told, are dropping low-end discrete graphics in laptops this holiday season. Not all laptops, but a lot of them. And the ones they want to drop it in are because they just do not feel like the performance is worth the cost and power losses you would get if you just stuck with one Meteor Lake chip. Basically, what I am told is if you add, let's say, an RTX 4050 to a Meteor Lake laptop, you lose, even if you're not using it really, a third of your battery life compared to the power savings you would have with just one SOC of Meteor Lake. And with an RTX 4070 in mixed usage, you can cut your battery life in half. So to put yourself, let's put ourselves here in OEM's shoes, if you are considering Adding a 4050 to a Meteor Lake laptop, even a 35 watt one, it needs to be at least 50% better than integrated Meteor Lake before it's even debatably worth that trade off. And just to put things in perspective here, OEMs are deciding if adding an ADA GPU to thin laptops, like in this example on screen, a Dell XPS, is worth not getting a 30 to 17 hour battery life instead of that around nine hour one which if you'll notice if a dell xps gets a 13 to 17 hour battery life it would allow dell to advertise that they have a longer battery life than a macbook m2 pro and that is something dell does not want to miss and so let's add even more perspective here when we're talking about the decision OEMs have to make on whether or not they want to have a discrete graphics card in a Meteor like laptop. So if you're going to put one of these 4060s, 4070s, or 4050s in one of these ultra thin premium laptops, keep in mind, it's ultra thin. You're actually probably going to be adding the 35 to 45 watt variant of Lovelace, which is we know from the laptop announcement that it goes down to 35 watts. And as luck would have it, Jared of Jared's Tech just coincidentally this week benchmarked how much performance you lose at lower TDP levels with these cards. And yeah, you can lose 25 to 40% performance if you go to basically the max Q configuration of Lovelace. So that's really the configuration you need to talk about when we're talking about the trade-offs here. Because what OEMs are trying to decide is in mixed usage, not even just gaming, is adding like a 35-watt GPU worth cutting your battery life in half. And so let's actually take a look at how good Meteor Lake would have to be for it to not be worth adding a graphics card. So if we go to Tech Power Up and we use an RTX 3070 desktop card as a proxy for laptop 4070 performance, but then remember that it would be a Max-Q variant, so let's cut it down by, I don't know, 40%, and then cut that in half because you're cutting battery life in half. Oh, look at that. You would get Meteor Lake having performance around a desktop 1650. And then for good measure, let's also look at the business case for considering adding an RTX 4050 Max-Q graphics card to a Meteor Lake laptop. 
All right, so for a proxy on tech power up, I'm going to use an RTX 2060. I think that's close to a high TDP version of the six gigabyte 4050. All right, and then let's make it 25% weaker because this is the max Q variant. It doesn't lose as much power as the 4070 does, but it loses about 25% from what I saw in Jared's text testing. And then let's also cut down battery life by 33%. Again, not as big of a hit as a 4070 probably, but a notable hit and oh look, around 1650 desktop performance again. And then keep in mind what I was just looking at there. I was just linearly lining up battery life and performance and saying you would want at least as much more performance as you are losing battery life before you even consider the fact that you need to pay for that graphics card, pay for its cooling, design a board that implements it, that takes time, money. There's so many more costs that go into adding that graphics card too, to where if the battery life loss is equal to the performance gain, that's not worth it to OEMs. And I understand why it's not worth it. If you're going to cut down your battery life by 33 to 46%, almost in half, then it's just not worth adding anything that's not at least double the performance of Meteor Lake. And a lot of these low-end laptop Lovelace graphics cards just aren't at that level. And so, yeah, there you go. That is my analysis of the OEM and working with OEM whispers to Meteor Lake integrated performance. But now I drop the bombshell in your face. I haven't just been talking to people that work with OEMs. I've also been talking to people within Intel, and I am directly told that integrated Meteor Lake performance, and I have seen some benchmarks showing this, should be around GTX 1650 Ti laptop performance. So probably a bit above Phoenix, meaning this internal slide from AMD, I think it's incorrect to reality. This is where I believe Meteor Lake's integrated graphics performance actually is at least on the same level as Phoenix and probably slightly better. And there's a remote possibility some golden variants could get close to Strix. And so, yeah, that's not the only stuff I know about Meteor Lake, though. I just wanted to start this video by talking about the design considerations and why OEMs will be dropping dedicated graphics cards in a lot of laptops for both AMD and Intel designs moving forward. But now it is time to get to 14th gen Raptor Lake refresh, Meteor Lake, and Arrow Lake information. But first, in ad from Micro Center. This video is sponsored by Micro Center, who's opening up a new store in Indianapolis, the first new store in eight years, bringing the total to 25 nationwide. By signing up and visiting the Indianapolis store, you can receive a 128 gigabyte flash drive for free. You do need to go there to get this flash drive, but you don't need to be a new customer you can be a long-term micro center customer and if you go to their new indianapolis store they'll just give you a free flash drive for showing up but if you are a new customer to micro center you can get $25 off any order that is over a hundred dollars this month and you can then get another $25 off that order if it's a build you submit to Micro Center to show off. And all of these offers stack. The new customer orders, the free flash drive, the build submission, and all of their other amazing bundles they have on their website right now that you can order and then pick up at the store. So go to Micro Center to support Moore's Law is Dead. Or even just click on the links in the description. Clicking on those links helps out the channel so much. All right, let's just get right into this Intel 14th and actually some early 15th gen leak in May of 2023. And I actually don't have any of those qualifying bullet points that I tend to put up front here. All I'm going to do is audibly tell you there are a lot of architectures that I am mentioning in this leak. And I use some abbreviations after qualifying what the abbreviation is in some of these lines. And all I can say is it's going to get a bit complicated, but I didn't want to oversimplify final performance estimates based on some of the reports, slides, and documents I've seen. I just wanted to tell you the raw information because there's both some above average good news on Meteor Lake, and there's also some below average missing expectations news. And so instead of trying to simplify things, I'm just going to tell you what the documents say, and you're going to have to pay attention to the architectures. But let's get into it. I have a lot of stuff to talk about. And the first one is Raptor Lake Refresh, or LPLR. It's launching quarter three as 
14th gen on desktop to the existing sockets Raptor Lake and Alder Lake use, and also 14th gen HX on laptop. There's been consternation on if this would be labeled 14th gen. From what I am told now by multiple people, it will be, and that should tell you right there, it's not going to be a tiny increase. They wouldn't give it a new generation name if it was tiny. And it is still, though, 8 big cores and 16 little cores. That's 8 Raptor Cove and 16 Gracemont cores. And that will be a new 8 plus 16 die. And there will also be a new 6 plus 8 and 2 plus 8 configuration as well. Again, anyone seeing that they're calling this 14th gen and they're not just refreshing the top die, but multiple dies should tell you they wouldn't bother to refresh multiple dies unless they were getting really good results out of them. And though some of those results are crazy boost clocks. Apparently, top Raptor Lake products like the i9-14900K should hit 6.2 gigahertz at a minimum, according to multiple sources. And some of them think there is a very remote but still tiny chance you could even see 6.5 gigahertz on some KS model this year. And so I wouldn't expect 6.5 gigahertz, but I would certainly expect at least 6.2 and possibly 6.3 or 6.4 gigahertz, which means, yeah, this isn't going to be like a 3% increase. I think we're looking at here at least least a 4 to 8% single threaded performance increase, which is kind of actually what you saw going from Alder Lake to Raptor Lake. And so that's why it's getting 14th gen, because it is a arguably a generational performance uplift that will have even higher all core boost clocks. Now, unfortunately, I don't have exact you know, sustained boost clocks for both the P cores and E cores, you know, Raptor Cove and Gracemont cores. Uh, those really, they don't know exactly what they're going to be until right before launch when they do final testing on sustained clocks. But what Intel has here is a working DLVR that was disabled in the original Raptor Lake. And now that they've gotten it working and even tweaked it a bit, they're getting a 10 to 20% reduction in power at the same clocks as Raptor Lake and 13th gen got. So if you think about it, if you reduce power from, say, I don't know, let's just call it 320 watts to like 250 watts with the i9, well, that means you have more headroom to boost all of the core clocks way higher for sustained all core loads. And so this is going to be a notable uplift actually again. And depending on the SKU, then expect single digit increases in gaming performance and double digit increases in multi-threading performance over the previous generation. And so the overall pitch from Intel to consumers very soon when they announce this is going to be, hey, we've got comparable gaming performance to Zen 4 X3D, and we've got better multi-threading. Right now, they kind of argue they have better multi-threading, but there's still plenty of benchmarks where Zen 4 wins. I do think that this 10% or more possible boost in multi-threading will be enough for Intel to firmly argue we've got the best multi-threading and then those games where they were winning slightly now they're going to be winning notably and those games where they were slightly losing now they're beating Zen 4 X3D but you know those games like Fight Simulator and a lot of other ones where AMD wins by well sometimes they win by like 20 30 percent or more yeah that's never going to change though the way I'm probably going to see this is Raptor Lake Refresh trades blows with Zen 4 X3D and gaming but, of course, Zen 4 X3D uses way less energy in long term. As newer and newer games come out, you're going to see Zen 4 X3D probably keep ahead on average. But this is good enough to tread water, which is good, because Intel needed something decent with how Meteor Lake's turning out to be a mixed bag. But and let's get to it then, huh? Meteor Lake. This launches between August and October for laptops, also as 14th gen this year. It was hoping actually years ago they wanted it to come out at the beginning of this year and then it got pushed back to quarter four pat is insisting on pulling it up for back to school season because he knows they need to have distance between this and strix for it to take a decent amount of market share or even keep market share and i'm actually also told there's still a chance of this launching to desktop on a new socket next year lga 1851 by quarter two probably as like an i5 uh 15600 k and yeah, they've still canceled the 6 plus 16 and 8 plus 16 high core count variants of Meteor Lake, but they really seem to want to get something out the door to launch that socket early, get it saturated, get reviews in, argue they've got a new gaming processor on desktop for the mid-range so that LGA 1851 is out well before Arrow Lake is and they have less of the high pricing last minute shipment issues that we've seen with when Alder Lake came out and with when Zen 4 came out. And Ultra has been mentioned to me 
but only ever in regards to Meteor Lake products. And so I haven't seen it in writing, but I have talked to people who have spoken with Intel reps, and they always say, well, there's going to be ultra Meteor Lake products. I am under the impression that this is a way to differentiate Raptor Lake from Meteor Lake, especially in laptop, because if you think about it, they're going to have new 6 plus 8 Raptor Lake refresh. That's going to be 10 to 20% more efficient than their previous mobile generation, but that's only 10 to 20% better. Meteor Lake's going to be way more efficient, but not really that much more performance in the top end. And so I think what they want to do is say, here is an i5, i7, i9 from Raptor Lake Refresh. But if you want longer battery life and AI engine and new features, you can get the Ultra 5, the Ultra 7, and the Ultra 9. Still the same amount of cores, roughly same performance, but it's just better and more efficient. I think that's what Ultra is about, a way to differentiate these two product types. And like I've been saying, up to 6 plus 8 uh, core counts, that's 6 Redwood Cove plus 8 Crescent cores. And they're also preparing a 2 plus 8 die configuration as well. And current projections are that Meteor Lake should still get to 5.4 gigahertz for the 45 watt uh, H models. Which means that, yeah, it's going to have clock speeds comparable to what AMD has with Zen 4 and mobile. And so I do believe that Meteor Lake is going to have a lot of mobile performance crowns depending on the TDP and what you're looking at. But it isn't all good news for Meteor Lake. And to get to some of the disappointing news, I actually have to back up and tell you about other architectures linked to the development of Meteor Lake. And the first one is Redwood Cove Plus that I exclusively leaked would be used in Granite Rapids last year. That IPC remains at the 12 to 21% uplift over Raptor Cove that I have been saying for a while now is roughly what I'm expecting out of Meteor Lake. But you have to remember, when I'm talking to people about design goals in products that are coming out years away from my leaks, some people might be working on Granite Rapids, some people might be working on Meteor Lake, and some people might just be in testing and know what the goals are, but not know if they're going to hit those goals. It sounds like at least Granite Rapids is still on track to bring a decent uplift over Raptor Cove, but it sounds like Meteor Lake's Redwood Cove implementation isn't performing as well as they were hoping. Again, nothing to change about Granite Rapids, but it seems like Meteor Lake's is a little bit behind. And then I've also learned Sierra Forest utilizes an architecture called Sierra Glencores. Believe I'm also the first person to say that. These should be thought of as Crescent Plus cores. Again, we've already been establishing what is what, right? Meteor Lake uses six Redwood Cove and eight Crescent cores and Sierra Glen cores will be Crescent plus. I am told that the current projections for Glen's IPC in Sierra Forest is only around 8% over Gracemont. And this is disappointing for me because I was told that the goal for Crescent was at least 15% over Gracemont, but even the plus on it, the Glen core isn't hitting that. And so, yeah, what I've seen this week is a certified projection of Meteor Lake performance. You know, they'll get silicon, and then they'll test it, and then they'll get a new stepping and test that, and then marketing and segmentation people look at the recent testing and start planning how they're going to market these products. It's not quite final silicon, but it's almost final. And the testing showed that near final silicon, not final, but near final silicon for Meteor Lake was gaining an up to 10% IPC increase over Raptor Lake R. But remember, IPC has a lot of wiggle room. There was a very annoying saga following Zen 4's IPC where AMD announced 8% and then announced 13% in the final silicon. So I know that it can change. I know that maybe Intel will pick a clock speed where the IPC looks the best with the averages that looks the best and try to claim something like 11 or 12%. But I'd say that's the best case scenario at this point for Meteor Lake uh, Redwood Cove IPC, that we're not seeing 20%. It's going to be near the lower end of the estimates that I had, a little bit probably below their design goals. And some of the averages were in mid-single digits, which was very, very disappointing. And so I would just expect that, that Redwood Cove is somewhere, I don't know, between 5 and 12% IPC increase. And I don't have a firm quote on Crestmont IPC, although I've already told you it's not going to be over 8% because that's what Crestmont Plus is. But it does seem like this projection for Meteor Lake was doing combined 
mixed workload IPC for Redwood Cove plus Crestmont versus Raptor Cove plus Gracemont, which again, I've already established, you know, that was the previous one. What that tells me is based on what I'm seeing out of Crestmont plus cores, I think that Crestmont's could be dragging down the average of some of these scores. And that's why I just wanted to tell you guys all of the details here because it is kind of complicated. I expect Redwood Cove to at least get high single digits IPC, if not 10% or 11 or 12% maybe in the final silicon over Raptor Cove. But in mixed workloads, it seems like Crestmont's not even getting to double digits, and that's dragging down a lot of mixed core multi-threading workloads. Anyways, though, i7 and up gets 128 execution units. Uh, i5 and lower gets 96 execution units at most or less. And I am told that those top 128 execution unit models, they're benchmarking around a GTX 1650 Ti Max-Q and 3 d Mark Firestrike. And so I actually saw a uh, Time Spy score where it was, again, a little better than a 1650 Ti at lower TDPs. And what this means is that chart I showed you, AMD was underestimating Intel. But this still is incredibly unlikely to compete with Strix Point in integrated graphics. It's probably going to slightly beat Phoenix, and there will probably be games where Phoenix beats Meteor Lake, but not by the amount AMD thought. This won't be worse than Phoenix. Uh, and it, the ones that are getting the best graphics scores, there's a decent chance these are using Adamantine. It's manufactured on Intel 16 node into 128 megabyte slices, at least based on the documents I've seen. And actually, Adamantine goes below the GPU and SOC tiles, but above the base die. Now, I cannot confirm if any SKUs honestly get adamantine, only that they're testing prototypes with it. But I think they do have it because this would explain why AMD expected lower gaming performance than what Intel is getting in some of their tests. And so I do suspect at least some models will get adamantine, but definitely don't expect most of them to. Now, here's the good news. Meteor Lake is projected to consume 30 to 45% less energy than not Raptor Lake, but Raptor Lake are at same performance below 45 watts. That sounds a little complicated, but what that means is if you have a 45 watt Raptor Lake R, which remember is 10 to 20% more efficient than Raptor Lake, you're going to use in some scenarios, or you're going to get about the same performance at about 22 watts or so. So yeah, this is why they want to call Meteor Lake Ultra. They think they can sell you a 28 watt Meteor Lake laptop that performs like a 45 or maybe even 65 watt Raptor Lake R laptop. And so it's ultra double the battery life. And yeah, I based on that, you know, Phoenix is a bit more efficient than Raptor Lake and probably a little more efficient than Raptor Lake R, but Meteor Lake's then better than Raptor Lake R and should have a notable efficiency advantage over Phoenix. And here's something else. Meteor Lake and Air Lake share the same base tile. So it's conceivable Intel might decide to launch Air Lake, you know, with last gen integrated graphics that Meteor Lake has if Celestial gets delayed or canceled. It, they don't need to worry. It uses the same base size as Meteor Lake. They could put a new CPU, Lion Cove tile, and just keep the old graphics and a lot of the old stuff as well. And this is allowing Intel then to plan to launch whatever they have ready when they can, instead of having to wait for everything to be ready in a monolithic design. There's a lot of interchangeability between Meteor Lake and Air Lake. And again, that's why it wouldn't surprise me if Meteor Lake launched to desktop as i5s early next year, and then later that year, the i7 and i9 Air Lakes come out. Now, Air Lake then. Let's get into that. This is supposed to launch, and I'm told it's still on track, quarter four of 2024 to desktop uh, with TSMC 3 nanometer, and then to laptop with Intel 20A. Interestingly, and I did dig into this a bit, it was originally planned to use N3X, but because of three nanometer delays, they're using a more ready, shall we say, for the time variant of N3. I, I'm told, at least right now, and I know this sounds odd, but I'm told some of the die configs use N3 and some use N3E. That's what I've seen on documentation, so leave it at that. If it sounds weird, I somewhat agree with you, but that is what the plan is right now. And still A plus 16 cores, but it's Lion Cove plus Skymont. And here is some new information that I think is really exciting. Lion Cove, big cores with a 22 to 34% IPC increase over Redwood Cove. I've actually said that before, but I have more info to back it up. I can now confirm, and I saw a testing document that compared 
an early prototype of Arrow Lake that was 6 plus 8 to a Meteor Lake 6 plus 8 uh, uh, variant, and they got 30% higher single threading out of the Arrow Lake, and in mixed testing, like multi-core workloads, they got around 40% higher performance in multiple multi-threaded tests, you know, where you're stressing all of the big and little cores at the same time. And so even though Meteor Lake is maybe coming in later than expected and a bit weaker than expected, at least it's efficient. And at least Arrow Lake is expected to be a massive uplift, probably a bigger uplift than Zen 4 to Zen 5, although it is coming out after Zen 5. So I think Intel will actually need that and has a new L4 cache system for the CPU tile. I'm told this is not adamantine. There's some other L4 thing going on for that. And that also it has up to, which I think I've already leaked. I know Adore did as well, 320 celestial execution units, maybe with second gen adamantine. Second gen adamantine uses Intel 7 or 10 nanometer. And it's still early, but performance is expected to be between laptop 4050 and laptop 4060. All right, and there you go. What are my final thoughts on this mountain of information that I just leaked? Well, first of all, I think it's pretty obvious now why the higher core count designs of Meteor Lake, you know, those eight big core, 16 little core, and then six big core, 16 little core variants were canceled. Sometimes future products are canceled because they aren't turning out well, but also sometimes it's because there is another product that's turning out so well that other product isn't needed anymore. And I think that's actually the biggest factor here for why high core count models of Meteor Lake were canceled for desktop. At the end of the day, Raptor Lake Refresh is going to be like clocked like 15 to 20% faster than Meteor Lake. And Meteor Lake, maybe 10%, but not 20% higher IPC. There was no way around it. No matter how good Meteor Lake turned out, Raptor Lake Refresh on desktop was always going to probably be slightly better. And because it's based on a 10 nanometer node and a design that's already mostly done, it could launch sooner. So if they were to, you know, even though a 8 plus 16 Meteor Lake would probably be more impressive than Raptor Lake Refresh, that pro might not be ready till quarter two next year. And so why delay the launch of a 14th gen that you sorely need to keep up with Zen 4 X3D if you know you can launch a less efficient version of the same performance early in quarter three of this year? And that's what Raptor Lake Refresh is going to be. And then another thing I want to bring up, maybe now after seeing Arrow Lake's integrated graphics performance estimates, which could be RTX 4060 performance, you can understand why OEMs are ditching low-end graphics cards and laptop. Yeah, Meteor Lake's integrated graphics is still only going to be around Phoenix or a little better. So 1650 to 1650 Ti performance. That's not crazy. That's not remotely close to a 4050. But it is good enough, and if it's half the performance but double the battery life of a low-end Intel graph, uh, NVIDIA graphics card, well, you're saving money and doubling battery. That's probably a good trade-off, especially because if you're an OEM, you know that Arrow Lake uses the same base die and is drop-in compatible. And so you're like, well, it's this good now, but in the future, maybe even before Blackwell launches, they're going to have something as good as a 4060. Look, OEMs only design their new laptop chassis every like two to four years. So if you're designing around the knowledge that every year Intel and actually AMD with Strix and Strix Halo products are going to have performance that goes head-to-head -head with 4060s and maybe 4070s and AMD's uh, department, it's not worth it. You're planning for the future. And in fact, on that note, compatibility of the base die between Arrow Lake and Meteor Lake, another thing I'd bring up is I think Meteor Lake is actually going to get a lot of design wins this year just because it's compatible with Arrow Lake, right? Again, OEMs design new chassis every two to four years. So even if Meteor Lake, if we're being honest, is really just like a 10% better Phoenix with better battery life, but it's way more expensive and elaborate, they know that if they design a laptop chassis for Meteor Lake, they can just drop Arrow Lake into it next year and they won't have to design a new thing. And so I think they're going to get design wins with Meteor Lake because over the next three years, this is the new platform from Intel of tiled APUs. And you might as well just hit the ground running with the first generation that is using this type of a socket. But while I think that Meteor Lake will get a decent amount of design wins by default because it's the new basis of all of Intel's upcoming mobility products over the next few years, do I think it's going to be able to fight AMD's Strix platform as well? Honestly, I don't. I'm sorry, guys. Like, it is what it is. 
Meteor Lake is going to be basically 10 to 20 percent better than existing Raptor Lake while having way better battery life. But that's it. Its integrated graphics will be lucky to notably beat Phoenix performance. Strix is going to be, I've already leaked, I think integrated graphics should be, I'd say, at least 30% better than Phoenix. And so there's no way around it. Meteor Lake's graphics will, at best, be trading blows and mostly losing to Strix. And the CPU, six big cores, eight little cores, versus AMD's all 12 big cores of Zen 5. It's going to get destroyed. So I think that's why Pat wants to make sure that Meteor Lake launches for back to school. He wants at least six months of sales before Strix comes out. And remember, Strix Point is a monolithic, like 200 something millimeter square design. It's going to be cheaper than Meteor Lake. And once it's out, it is more attractive. And so Pat knows they got to get that out now. And then, well, there you go. That's what basically everything looks like right now. Meteor Lake is coming out late. But it's not going to be pointless. As long as it can be out by the end of summer, Meteor Lake is going to basically be a more efficient Phoenix that's in between Phoenix and Strix performance. You have to pay extra for it, but it is going to have a lot better battery life. That's a compelling product that has a place in this market. But if let me be clear about this. If it slips to next year, it's going to be a disaster for Intel. They need it Right now, Strix is going to humiliate it at a lower cost. And then after that, they need to get Arrow Lake out as soon as possible. Because although I think Arrow Lake looks very impressive, if it's not out before Zen 6, I just think Intel is going to be slapped around in laptop performance and efficiency for way too long. And they could lose a lot of ground in laptop market share. But on that note of Intel delays, projections, and opinions, I want to close this video then talking about, well, the sentiment I sometimes see out there that I am overly negative towards Intel. Like, sometimes I'll see comments like this on YouTube where they'll say, oh, Meteor Lake sounds great. You got it all wrong. It's coming out this year. And that dunce, and these dunces that put comments like that, clearly didn't watch the video because if they did, they would have seen I was depressed in that video that Meteor Lake was trying to launch quarter three of 2023. And it is. I was right in that video. And in fact, in that video, I also said that it looked like Meteor Lake coming to desktop will be limited to i5 or i7 variants. And I think this is important to talk about because I think people see me not as excited as they think I should be when I leak things years before they come out because they're failing to realize as impressive as Meteor Lake sounds, I also know what AMD is going to have at the same time. And I also know that a year before now, Meteor Lake sounded a lot more impressive. You know, people are going to look at what I leaked today and go, oh my God, up to 6.5 gigahertz Raptor Lake refresh. Oh my God, we've got Meteor Lake maybe having double the efficiency of existing Raptor Lake. AMD screwed and they're missing key points that are making me go, it's actually kind of meh. Key points like the fact that AMD has not launched the cache variants of Dragon Range yet. Think about that. If Meteor Lake basically is like, I don't know, 30% more efficient or something than Phoenix and offers 10% better performance, what do you think is going to happen to Dragon Range variants that are out there right now that are already impressive with efficiency that get vCache? It's probably going to roughly match Meteor Lake in a lot of metrics already this year before we even talk about Fire Range launching next year with vCache variants that if they don't have Arrow Lake ready for, is going to wipe the floor with anything Intel has then. And most of what they're supposed to have is just Raptor Lake refresh through most of next year. That's not good news. I'm not negative towards Intel, people. I just know that as exciting as a Raptor Lake refresh that goes past 6.2 gigahertz is, as exciting as a Meteor Lake product is that basically gives you something 10 or 20% better than Phoenix with better battery life, I know that AMD has other stuff they haven't launched yet including this year with a Vcash version of Zen 4 Mobility products. That means Intel has still missed an opportunity here that they could have had if Meteor Lake launched in quarter two. In fact, Phoenix now is basically more of a quarter, shall we say, mid-quarter two product than it is a quarter one product. Imagine if Meteor Lake came out on time early this year before Phoenix even launched. No one would really care about Phoenix, but now they will, and AD has an opportunity to at least keep their mobility market share before they go insane with APUs 
next year. And the thing I want to close on is if I start souring on Arrow Lake, which let's be very clear about this. I've been excited about Arrow Lake, which is a child of the Royal Core project I exclusively leaked years ago before everyone else started copying my Royal Core leaks. If I start souring on Arrow Lake, it's not because I hate Intel, guys. It will be because I've heard it's delayed, and Zen 6 sounds even more incredible. And for Intel, well, they better hope that doesn't happen. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for this exhaustive video. But it was exhaustive because it had so many exciting things to talk about. And I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, Please make sure you're subscribed to the Moore's Laws at YouTube channel. All the time I see people say they've been mysteriously unsubscribed. Double check that you're subscribed. That helps out the metrics and helps us reach more people so much. Ring the bell button so you don't miss upcoming Arrow Lake, Zen 5, Zen 6, and other leaks as well. And then, you know, also tell your friends about us and consider joining the Moore's Law is Dead Patreon. Patrons get access to exclusive die shrink videos. One came out talking about neural engines and a the future of AI today. So that's just an hour long video with pop ups and everything well edited that only patrons get access to for. $2 a month. That's it. You also get access to the Discord. You'll get access to the ability to submit reader mails for Broken Silicon, early ad-free episodes at the right tiers, the ability to ask guest questions like Daniel Nenny, who was just on, and all of that is there for those who love this content and want more of it or just want to show support because we cannot do this without growing the Patreon. Quality can't get higher, can't get new people helping us, can't do new renders of upcoming stuff unless we get more support. But I do want to thank everyone who does support us, and even if you don't want to support us on Patreon, well, at a minimum, thank you for watching. <laughs>